This was not a video that I was planning on making, but join me in, you know, the backyard patio here, and I'm going to share my recent obsession with the dragonflies that live in my backyard. There's one of them on that stick right now, and I'm waiting for it to try to eat a fly. Actually, I'm waiting for this camera to save. I recently bought this new toy. I mean, tool for making fast things slow. And although I have a bunch of physics -y projects that I want to do with it, I first wanted to just, oh my God, there's another dragonfly up there. They're everywhere. Somebody eat something. It's not saved yet. No, nobody eat anything. Although I do have a bunch of physics -y projects planned for this camera, the first thing I wanted to do with it was just bring it outside and try to film something that moves really fast. And at the top of my list are dragonflies. They are beautiful creatures. They're so cool. And I have always been fascinated by their agility, which makes them a great subject for a high-speed camera. So a couple weeks ago, I had a great strategy. I was just sort of blindly holding the camera in front of me. It was too dark to see whether it was in focus. And then I would bump into a branch and get a dragonfly to take off. Foolproof. I might have gotten a landing. After a few of these takeoff shots, I got extremely lucky and one actually landed right in front of me. And I got this clip of a dragonfly coming in for a landing and sort of stabilizing itself, reaching out and grabbing a branch. We're gonna dive into a deep over analysis of this clip later because how these things fly is fascinating. But right now I'm trying to catch a dragonfly hunting. I have my only two actual good tripods. I have eight light stands, three cameras, including my phone that I'm filming with right now, and like a lot of other stuff. So let me explain why I need all of these things. Over here I have the cameras, and since the high-speed camera doesn't actually talk to electronic lenses, and the lens that I bought that I wanted to use with the high-speed camera can't focus without using a motor that's inside of it, I need two cameras. I have my regular video camera over here, and I've been taking this lens out, putting it in, adjusting the aperture and the focus, and then very carefully, without touching anything, pulling it out of here and sticking it onto the high-speed camera. And the offset between these two just happens to be what is the focus distance difference between the lens mounts in here at a three meter distance. I spent some time the other day working out what the focus volume of this camera really is. In order to see a dragonfly attack a regular fly and get that in focus, the entire event needs to happen within a box that's about this big. The sides and the top, oh God, there's a dragonfly right there. Sorry. The sides and the top and bottom of this box are literally just the edges of the frame, like what the camera can see. And that's set by the focal length and the sensor size. Now the depth of this box is controlled by the depth of field of the lens. Basically anything that's closer to the camera than this box is going to be out of focus, and anything that's farther from the camera than this box is going to be out of focus. But everything that's within this narrow window here is going to be awesome. Now unfortunately, the dragonflies that keep landing on this stick but have not yet attacked a fly on camera, cannot see this box. And they are not trained to stay within this box, which means that I'm trying to make it as large as possible. Specifically, I'm trying to make it as deep as possible so that if they attack this way or this way or whatnot, they remain in focus. The painful part is that in order to make this box deeper, you need to throw away more light within the optics train of the camera and lens. You can get more stuff to be in focus, but you're doing that with less light which means that your whole image gets dimmer and fainter and it's basically harder to see everything. Now, because high-speed cameras already require a ridiculous amount of light, this becomes a problem in a hurry. That's what this thing is for. Sun comes down, past the scene, hits this reflector and comes back up. After playing with the footage from last week, I want a little bit of light to be coming from behind the dragonflies. I think you need to have just a little bit of light coming from around in order to reflect and, you know, reflect through, reflect? refract through the translucent wings. I also am squinting because there is an obscenely bright light over here behind this shade. 
This light is so bright that you can tell when it turns on, even when this thing is in direct sun. It, it can actually supplement direct, oh God, and I just looked at it and I got green all over. Whew, don't do that. It's a bright light. So all in then, we basically have like three suns and two cameras, right this minute, three, pointed at this one spot in space. And there's a dragonfly right there being very cooperative. Hello. You wanna eat something on camera? So they've got the whole yard and the whole woods that way to hunt in. So why are they doing it right here? How am I actually convincing the dragonflies to sit right here in frame and attack right there, also in frame. At the top of this light stand, there's an especially disgusting mixture of warm beer, overripe banana peels, and sugar. Ah, oh, there's flies everywhere. <laughs> Apparently most dragonflies like to look up at a 30 to 60 degree angle and pursue small prey that's 10 to 30 centimeters away. That number goes up as the prey gets physically larger. And since I have mostly house flies here and this study was being done with like mosquitoes and fruit flies, I'm hopeful that my dragonflies attack from a 30 to 40 centimeter range. I may actually back that up in a few minutes. They also like contrast. And from the perspective of a dragonfly on this branch, any flies buzzing around this bait tray show up as nice trackable black dots against the clear blue sky. I do know that last week I was reliably getting dragonflies to perch on this stick. I wanted to know more about this, so I went to go read some papers after the fact. Although I had set up my experiment that way, I didn't know if that's actually something dragonflies preferred. So th this has been happening. They face the wrong way because the reflector is too bright. They think it's the sky. And there have been a lot of studies done trying to figure out how dragonflies see and how they have an order of magnitude faster visual reaction time than humans. It seems like they do intentionally position themselves and tilt their heads so the most acute region of their vision is pointed up towards the blue sky, but away from the sun. However, they don't just use sky contrast. My favorite experimental design by far was a study where the researchers captured flies and hand-painted yellow stripes on them to make them look like wasps, and the dragonflies stopped attacking. It's pretty amazing. From my control center here under the umbrella, I can control the light, I can run both cameras, and maybe most importantly, I have a long stick attached to the bait stand, and when I kick it, I can get the flies to leave the bait and become prime targets. Come on, flies, get out of there. Get eaten, you can do it. So while photographer Brian waits for cooperative insects, let's check out the clip from a couple weeks ago. I got a couple takeoff shots that are cool, but this one where the dragonfly comes in for a landing is far and away my favorite. In this clip, you really get to see how dragonflies, well, fly. And it's not as simple as just flapping your wings regularly and ending up where you wanna go. I also love this bit where it waits and sort of thinks for a minute, and it really gingerly reaches out with all three sets of legs in sequence to grab this branch before it you know, turns off its propulsion. Then it sort of adjusts and stares right back at the camera. It's like I trained it for this shot. Aside from simple gliding, dragonflies have three different patterns of wing beats. And in this clip, we actually get to see all of them. It's kind of like a horse switching between a gallop and a trot and whatnot. As the dragonfly descends into frame, its front wings and back wings are beating at the same frequency, but they're phase shifted. The back wings are beating 90 degrees ahead of the front wings. This basically means that the front wings look like they're lagging behind. When the back wings reach the top of their stroke, the front wings are still moving forward. And by the time the back wings are beating down in the middle of their stroke, the front wings have only just hit their peak. This is by far the most common cadence I observed in my footage, and it's like the gallop of the dragonfly. It's the fastest forward propulsion, and as we'll see in a minute, definitely used for rapid attacks. When the dragonfly hits the bottom of its path here, it needs to stop falling and start heading sideways. It needs to accelerate quickly, and to do that, it needs more thrust than the phased cadence can provide. For just a few beats, it synchronizes its wings into phase, pumping all four wings simultaneously. After this moment of powerful redirection, it pretty quickly goes back to the 90 degree gallop. The third beat pattern is 180 degrees out of phase, where the front and back wings beat opposite each other. This cadence is apparently most commonly used to hover and I guess fly slowly with a lot of efficiency, but I saw very little of it in my footage. I would imagine it's a bit more stable because the thrust frequency effectively doubles and the thrust magnitude gets cut in half. 
but this especially photogenic dragonfly uses a few beats of counterstroked wings to resituate itself on the branch when it decides to stare straight into the camera. It's just a quick adjustment, but it's very clearly 180 degrees out of phase and distinct from the flying cadence that we saw a minute ago. The front wings hit the top of their stroke at the same time as the back wings reach the bottom of their stroke. Let's check in with past Brian and the less cooperative dragonflies. And you know you want to, oh, always moving, but nobody's flying away. Somebody fly away, give them a target. You know you want to come back. Yep, I'm gonna get you a meal. I'm gonna get you a meal, stay there. No, this is my breakfast. I gave you beer. Go eat the beer. Okay, so maybe it's not quite time yet. The other thing that struck me about this clip was the violence of the dragonfly's flight. If we really zoom in on the dragonfly's body, it's seriously lunging every time it beats its wings. I was curious, so I went back outside, found the same stick, held up a tape measure, came back inside, tracked the dragonfly's head through the entire clip, converted the trail from pixels and frames to millimeters and seconds, did some averaging, took some derivatives, and ended up with the stats. In the beginning of this clip, the dragonfly travels about 15 centimeters in 500 milliseconds, and it's got an incredibly inconsistent speed. This is the velocity in X and Y, and you can see that each wing beat changes the speed by something like a quarter of a meter per second, and it does this 30 times per second. If we take another derivative, we can get to acceleration, and literally every time this poor creature flaps, it experiences a 4G swing. Can you imagine being shaken that violently every time you wanted to walk in a straight line? I always thought dragonflies were cool, but doing a bit of math has given me even more respect for these incredible, incredible biological flying machines. Why do they need to be so good at flying, you ask? Well, they gotta eat. Well, I'm packing it up for today. Uh, I've moved the whole setup multiple times. Now I'm over there. There are like a million little gnats that you can see in the sunlight against that hedge and no more dragonflies, but it's supposed to be sunny again tomorrow. When I wrapped up on Saturday, which was day two of filming, I thought that I had nothing but a few missed hunts on tape, which confused me because in the papers I'd read, dragonflies are supposed to be 90 to 95% successful. Basically, when they pursue something, it's going to get eaten. That said, the dragonfly in this clip has a very understandable excuse. It's following prey that's off screen right now, but it's locked in. See it take off, accelerate, there's the target, approach, and wait a minute, that's not a meal. That's like a pine needle or something falling out of a tree. Although this dragonfly nopes out of the chase when it realizes its mistake, we still get to see how much thought the dragonfly actually puts into its pursuit. You may think that it sees a target and flies straight at that target until it catches something, but it doesn't. It actually predicts the path the target is taking, chooses an interception location and an interception time, and then gets there to make the catch. Or, in this case, not quite. Since the target here is just falling at a nearly constant speed, the dragonfly makes a really good initial guess at the interception location, and it flies on what's basically a dead straight line to that interception point. At the other end of the spectrum, here's a bug that's lucky to be alive. This genius actually runs into the perched dragonfly, at which point they chase each other around in a circle for a fraction of a second. If I was the dragonfly, I might have just eaten this one out of spite. For all these clips, it turns out I really didn't know what I had until I was looking at them later. That falling pine needle, for example, there's no way I could have seen that tiny thing on the camera screen outside. I'm glad I decided to save it anyway, because it was cool. And it turns out that I had saved one more really good one. Yeah, so this clip is kind of awesome. I feel like it's basically impossible for me to watch this without imagining it going as it eats the fly. Other than a little bit of motion blur, if you track the dragonfly too closely, this shot is everything I was hoping for. 
Granted, I was using basically a 360 degree shutter to get a big enough light bucket to collect this shot. So a little bit of blur is kind of inevitable. But after that landing video, when I pictured this shot in my head, I'd been imagining the arms just sort of reaching out the same way and gingerly plucking a gnat or mosquito from the air. But it's more like a freight train crashing into the gnat mouth first. Not only does this dragonfly track and predict its intercept with the fly, it literally aims to basically bite the thing out of the air. The arms reaching out seem more like a funnel than a mechanism for grabbing. In this case, when we do the tracking, we see the dragonfly does have to slightly adjust course to meet this intercept point. The path isn't a perfectly straight line anymore. I guess live prey is slightly less predictable, but really just slightly. After the catch, the dragonfly is returning to its perch. And I kept looking in real time once the dragonflies landed to see if they were chewing on something to know whether their hunt was successful. But in this particular case, the fly was pretty much, you know, munched before the dragonfly even had time to turn around. For those of you keeping track at home, that's about a tenth of a second. When was the last time that you ate a meal in a tenth of a second? With a newly found false sense of confidence from watching this clip, I did go back outside for third day of filming with the intent to catch a hunt at a closer zoom and faster shutter angle. I did get a couple cool takeoff and landing shots that look much crisper with the shorter exposure time, but no more flies getting eaten. Maybe there's an entomologist in the audience who set up something like this for a lab experiment and can tell me exactly what I was doing wrong, but based on my limited experience, this was a tricky shot to capture. The only thing I would have done differently if I could was to intentionally release fruit flies or mosquitoes or something in a known location, then maybe even try to guide those you know, prey flies in a particular direction. But even then, I think that getting everything in focus is pretty much a shot in the dark. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed figuring out how to film it. Dragonflies are really cool. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.